Hi, I'm James Wilkinson and welcome to Wayfarer. Coming up on this week's show, we check into one of the world's biggest hotel conferences, which is being held in Melbourne this week. We go high flying on Emirates, we head to Europe and much more. Before we do that, here's this week's travel news. Jetstar is set to launch flights from the Gold Coast to Seoul, becoming the first low-cost airline operating between Australia and South Korea, taking off in December 2019. Jetstar will operate the flights using a Boeing 7878 Dreamliner aircraft three times a week. To celebrate the launch, Jetstar is offering fares from just $179 one way. Jetstar Group CEO Gareth Evans said South Korea had the potential to quickly become one of the most popular Asian destinations for Australian travellers. Cathay Pacific is set to upgrade its Australian flights with Melbourne and Perth to get Airbus A350-1000 aircraft on flights from October this year. On board the world's most advanced aircraft, customers will find business, premium economy and economy class cabins. From October, Cathay Pacific is also set to deploy the Airbus A350-900 on one of its daily Sydney services. Virgin Australia has this week altered its Boeing 737 MAX orders, deferring deliveries of the jet until July 2021. The airline has also revealed it's converted its additional 15 of its 737 MAX 8 aircraft on order to larger Boeing 737 MAX 10s. The Boeing 737 MAX fleet still remains grounded across the world, following two fatal accidents in Indonesia and Ethiopia. In hotel news, Melbourne has been playing host to Asia Pacific's largest ever hotel conference, AHIS, with almost 850 people descending on Grand Hyatt Melbourne for the three-day event. A flurry of new hotels were announced at AHIS this week, including a new Mojo Nomad Hotel for Melbourne from Overlo, the debut of Oakwood Hotels in Australia, and a new QT Hotel for Newcastle alongside an Art Series Hotel in Perth. A Hyatt Place Hotel was also announced for Brisbane, and let's find out more now from developer Nando Pelicano. Yeah, look, uh, Hyatt Place is coming on board to South City Square, which is a $700 million mixed-use precinct. A uh, mix of residential, commercial, hotels, cinemas, restaurants, gymnasiums. Um, so having Hyatt Place come on board is, is a, a huge announcement for us. So we've seen a lot of luxury coming on in Brisbane at the moment. It's obviously a really good gap in the market for a Hyatt Place hotel. Absolutely. So we ran an international campaign uh, to secure a hotel operator. We had seven solid bids from international groups, but we felt the Hyatt Place brand and what they offered was very well suited to what we were creating at South City Square. Obviously an exciting time for Brisbane. We talk about those luxury hotels coming on, but at the same time, lots of great bars, restaurants, cafes. Brisbane's really thriving at the moment. Absolutely. There's good growth, there's good population growth. Um, it's a city now for choice. People actually want to live there. It's got really good vibrancy about it. And uh, what really sort of made you guys excited to work with Hyatt on this project? Yeah, look, we, um, we inspected their um, facility at Essendon Fields and we were really impressed with what they had created there. Um, and look, they're, they're, they're family-based, family even though they're a public company, their values and, and the way they go about things is very similar to how we go about things being a family business. So, and as we're going to be the developer and the long-term owner, we wanted to pick someone who could have a good long-term relationship with. So that was very important for us, um, having very similar values. Obviously, mixed use is a pretty good mix at the moment in terms of hotel developments, would you say so? Um, absolutely. So, um, you know, I think with what, what we're creating with the whole mixed use precinct, I think the people who can come and stay at the Hyatt Place will have so many great facilities downstairs that we're creating as well. So it will just help improve that corporate and leisure stay as well. Melbourne's been playing host this week to the Australasian Hotel Industry Conference and Exhibition, which has attracted around 800 people. Let's catch up now with one of the most senior speakers at the event, IHG's Kenneth McPherson. All right, Kenneth, thanks so much for your time today. We're here in Melbourne, one of the biggest hotel conferences in the world is being held this week, and you've got a couple of great announcements. Right, thank you. Um, yes, we announced the new Holiday Inn in Remarkers Park in Queenstown. Absolutely beautiful location and that'll be a great contribution to that wonderful destination. And we've had the Crown Plaza Suites in Port Moresby as well. So it's been a big week for us. So it's been a big couple of years for you guys down in this part of the world. You've got a, a pipeline of new hotels coming that's getting bigger and bigger. Well, if we were here a year ago, 
uh, we would have said that this was a, a business with 15 hotels in the pipeline, with 29 hotels today. And you know, we're thrilled with that. It's been a, an absolute result of the new model we've put in place um, and, and, and the work that's been building up the relationships with our owners. So it's a, it's a great success and many more to come. Obviously an exciting time for IHG, bolstering a lot of different areas. You've got your, your traditional brands, your Holiday Inns, Crown Plazas, Intercons. Now on top of that, Six Senses, Kimpton and Regent. It's very exciting for you. It is, yeah. I mean, Regent gives us that brand that we wanted above Intercontinental. Um, really working on that. Great reaction from existing owners and partners that we work with. Um, and we're working now on how to bring those great new hotels with the right owners in the right locations. Six Senses, um, you know, worldwide renowned to be at the top of the resorts business. So again, taking that forward. Um, and with Kimpton, we had a just tremendous year last year. Um, signings in key locations, opening of the Fitzroy Kimpton in London. Um, you know, really those three are transforming what we've got in luxury. That's really exciting for you, I think, from Asia Pacific, from that perspective. I mean, this is such a huge opportunity from a hotel growth perspective. And you've got some amazing hotels coming. It's not just a great area, but the quality of your hotels in Asia Pacific is phenomenal. Um, I, and I agree. Uh, this year is going to be very big for us um, in, in Australasia. So we're going to have the opening of Hayman Island. Um, iconic hotel in an incredibly iconic destination. Um, and that's going to happen on the 1st of July. So that's going to be one example. We've also got the Intercontinental Sydney that's going to be fully refurbished and we're very excited about that. Plus signings of new hotels are going to take us into great destinations with really high quality assets. So we are, you know, we're, we're pleased with that. And the Business Travellers brand, Crown Plaza, refresh coming and some amazing new hotels coming for this part of the world as well. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, those new Crown Plaza designs and that is positioning that hotel that's so good for business mice you know, and a little bit more but it's just taking it right to where that modern traveller is. So the flexible working space, the new room design. Um, we're very confident in Crown Plaza. Not, not a bad timing. Uh, Tasmania right now is one of the hottest tourism destinations in the world, actually, in terms of from a demand perspective and an interest perspective. So you're going into the right locations as well. Well, that's something we're very conscious of, is to go right brand, right location, partner with you know, high quality owners, and then we can all play our role to do a brilliant job for guests, drive fabulous performance of the hotels, and of course build reputation together, which is so important. Obviously loyalty, you're playing a huge component in all of this, isn't it? Ah, it is, yeah. And actually if you look at the portfolio and the hotels we're bringing in, what that does for the IHG Rewards Club and its way to drive value for the hotels, I think is, is fabulous. And that's building a very strong delivery already in this part of the world. Coming up after the break on Wayfarer, we're taking you to Paris. Dear Britain. Dearest Britain. Dear old Britain. We love you. We love you. With all your different views on the world. And your different stories to tell. Maybe it's your big heart. Just see us good. Like BA, one, two, three. Your sense of style. <laughs> your sense of adventure. Welcome to BA 100. Make your way around to the right more often. The way you pick yourself up when things get tough. Ooh. And dust yourself off. Sorry. A100, you're clear for takeoff. How you follow your own path. How you tell it like it is. Politely, of course. You've led revolutions. Of all kinds. Yet you won't shout about it. It's just not in your nature. Instead, you'll quietly make history. Pots. Building. Yorkshire pudding. Mm. Beds. Discoveries. Um, UK Gary. Cake. Rabbit. Um, ideas. Love, love. Rather a lot of tea. We love you, Britain. You make us who we are. Bon boy. Bon boy. Ah. Bon boy. 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 Bon bo
Bon boy. Bon boy. Bon boy. Bon boy. Bon boy. Bon boy. Discover the new language of travel. Marriott Bonvoy. 30 hotel brands, endless experiences. Rewards reimagined. Let's head across Paris now and check into another one of the city's most amazing luxury hotels, the Royal Monsieur. Well, thank you so much for your time. We're here at the beautiful Raffles in Paris. And tell us about this amazing property. Well, it's a property that is part of the Raffles family since 2010, since we reopened. It's a property that features today 149 guest rooms and suites, and it was fully designed after the reopening by Philip Stark. And in my opinion, it's one of the most sophisticated hotels today that Paris has to offer. It is. It's certainly one of the most beautiful grand hotels in this city. We've seen a lot of new hotels come online, but it's one of those really beautiful old world properties that's been reimagined, isn't it? It is, and that was actually our biggest handicap in the beginning when we reopened it. We reopened as an old traditional hotel, and today actually we feature, as I mentioned, some of the most sophisticated rooms and suite products that the city has to offer, which in, at the same point for me is actually timeless, because what it really feels like it's a residential element uh, in terms of hospitality. So if you're looking for something to be living as a local, you with the Royal Monso, you choose the right destination. And if you look at the hotel itself, you've got some great food and beverage on offer, including one of the world's most famous chefs, very well known for his uh, eclectic cuisine. I think F&B is uh, more and more becoming the stronger part of the hotel because it dictates the vibrance of the hotel, it dictates the clients that you get, and the biggest compliment one can get if you're accepted by the locals, uh, you have a winning factor, and this is exactly the case with the Royal Monceau. 95% of our F&B goes is not linked with hotel occupancy, but is linked to the Parisian guests that come here. They search for us because for us it's a comfortable atmosphere, it's not a stiff atmosphere. When they come after work, they can actually take off their jackets, roll up their sleeves and feel part of the community that gathers here. So today we have a long bar that all the roughest properties feature, which is a classic and which is a very famous hangout for the locals. We have Nobu Matsuisa, which is our Japanese uh, Peruvian contemporary uh, dining, which is a mega hit since we opened it in 2016. And today we do an average of 170 covers at dinner and uh, 92 covers at lunch. And then we have our little uh, cherry on the cake, which is Carpaccio, which is our fine dining Italian restaurant. We're awarded with one Michelin star. How important is that in a city right now, with Paris being such a culinary city at the moment, having great if and being in the hotel? I think it is very important, but as you can see also from our choices of uh, culinary options that we offer to our clients, we have gone the complete opposite way. Where when you go in all the big hotels or the big palace hotels, which are our friends and at the same time our competition, everyone really strives to go for a very gastronomic French cuisine, whereas we went for something completely different because we did a market analysis and we looked at who our audience and who our clientele was coming to visit the hotel on a day-to-day -day basis. And like I mentioned, we noticed that 95% of them were locals. So we looked out on the market to see what was actually missing in terms of gastronomy and we came up with these two uh, countries, uh, cuisines that were missing and that's why we said okay our hotel already is different so let's do the same thing with the F&B and so far that really has paid off. Like you said with some of more of the, the grand hotels in the city a lot of them have gone through renovations as well so it's a very highly competitive market that luxury market in Paris isn't it? I think Paris actually features the highest condensity of luxury hotels than any other city in the world uh, London, New York, uh, just because simply Everyone is located in the Golden Triangle. Paris is a destination in itself, but it doesn't diver diversify within, I'm going to stay on the left bank, I'm going to stay on the right bank, it's still Paris. Whereas London, if you go to London, you have nice place where you want to stay by the park, or you want to stay by downtown. It's a complete different, people choose their, des their hotels by the destination. Paris itself, yes, it's a, it's a cutthroat competition. Not only do you have all the major brands of hospitality here, you have icons such as the Ritz, such as the Plaza Atene Red Marquis Hotel. Which woman in the world doesn't know that hotel? And if you look at that, obviously it's a very competitive market. What's your X Factor here at the hotel? Our X Factor is I think that we are, I like to describe the hotel as 
if you would open an architectural digest and you would flip through the pages and you would come through, through a centerfold and look at an apartment, that's how I would picture a Parisian apartment to look like. So authentic, sophisticated, refined, uh, first class attention to details when it comes to the furnishing, when it comes to the fabrics. And that is what our key driver is to our clients. It's not for a first time stayer, but it's someone who's really looking to discover Paris from a Parisian point of view. And some fun concepts in the hotel. You've obviously got your own bookstore in here with an amazing library, and you've also got your own art concierge as well. Two, two things a lot of hotels in Paris don't have. Yes, I don't think that many hotels in Paris or around the world feature these, uh, these, these aspects of it. Our art concierge was because when we reopened the hotel with Philip Stark, obviously, much of it was around what was around, or was and is revolving around art. So we figured what better uh, point to associate that than to someone that is really dedicated to that perspective of it and at the same time Paris I mean that goes through the major exhibitions and major art connoisseurs in the world to really give a inside depth analysis of what is happening today. A great day spa and also some wonderful in-room amenities that you don't see in other hotels around the world either. Yes many to be discovered and many to be accepted but yes it's I think French hospitality it's all about the attention to detail and how we look at what we offer our clients from a day-to-day -day basis because today it's not just clients that come and stay with us or that come and stay at other hotels they're looking really for that authenticity because most of our clients face it they have nicer homes than the nicer hotel suites that we currently have so they're looking for that little extra attention to detail and a home away from home as you uh, as you like to put it you do feel like you're staying in a house here not a hotel yes i think that is also really the aspect that my team and myself would like to give to our clients that come here uh, you don't want to feel like uh, you're part of a room number, but you want to feel like you're part of being in someone's home family at the same time having all the services that you have in any palace hotel. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having us. Thank you very much for being with us and have a pleasant stay. Coming up after the break, we find out some of the wining and dining secrets of Emirates. Bienvenue à All. Welcome to All. Bienvenue à All. Live limitless. Bienvenido à All. Welcome to All. We are very happy to have you on our team. Bienvenuto à All. All for one. All for one. All for one. All for you. All for you. All for you. Welcome back to Wayfarer. When it comes to in-flight whining and dining, one of the leaders in the sky is Emirates. Let's find out now a few secrets to success with the head of in-flight catering, Joost Haymeyer. 
All right, Yost, thanks so much for your time. We're here in one of your storage facilities for Emirates that holds some of the most amazing wines in the world, and this is only a few days worth of stock for you, isn't it? Yeah, correct. If you just look behind me, this is one aisle out of nine, uh, and uh, that holds about a week worth of stock. So we turn over a lot of wine in a very short, short period of time. What I find impressive about Emirates at the moment is the quality of the wine. You know, your Montrachets and Margots and Cloudy Bays, you're really upping the ante from an onboard wine perspective. It, it's not something we've just started doing. You know, we made a decision 15 years ago um, to really develop a, a, a very high-end wine program, but also to start buying wines early. So uh, the, the difference between other airlines and ourselves is that we like to keep our own hand on, on how we buy the wine, when we buy the wine, how long we store the wine. And some of the wines that we're drinking today, we bought 15 years ago. So they've been maturing in our cellars for a very long time. And when they're at their peak, we, we, we bring them to market. It's also at a time, I think, where a lot of airlines are turning back the quality of the wine on board and you're maintaining a very high quality of wine on board. Uh, James, we, um, I, I can't comment on what other airlines do. I, I, I do know that when Tim Clark decided to take a much more proactive role in how we buy wine and, and, and the relationships we develop with the, the, the wine growers, not just in France, but we buy wines from 12 different wine producing countries. Uh, we know most of the growers, we have personal relationships with them. So it's also about their pride to be uh, on, on, on our aircraft and you know, when you fly business and first, uh, the wine growers really like to see their wines because it is the clientele that can afford to buy those wines. And yes, what we do as part of that value proposition is to give people wines that are going like, whoa, I mean, you know, I, I, I'd buy that for my 25th wedding anniversary. Uh, and, and, uh, and people can really equate uh, that value in the bottle uh, also to the, the, the price that they paid for their seat. Are you keeping things very bespoke as well, like you were when you were at Walgan Valley, you were, you were procuring local wines there and small batches of, and parcels of wines. You're also procuring small parcels of wines for the airline now. It's a similar concept, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it, it, is, it is similar. And we do the same with food, but um, uh, just to give you a, a, an, an idea, we uh, currently fly five different wine lists every day around the world. On average, about 75 wines uh, go to different, different parts of the world. Uh, so we really make our wine list bespoke to the, to the areas we, we fly into and uh, uh, the volumes are, are, are quite uh, amazing. Uh, annually, anywhere between two and three hundred wines, we, uh, we, we, we channel through our wine list. That's quite a lot of different variations for an airline, but it's also obviously showing how much diversity you do have when it comes to buying wine, doesn't it? It's, it's not just the diversity, it's also uh, an, an understanding of our passenger profile and the care we put into our overall food and beverage offering. Uh, and it's fun, you know, it, it's fun to buy smaller parcels, knowing that you can put them on for a short amount of time on a, on a particular sector. Sometimes we even just go city specific. So, we'll, you know, people in, in, in Portugal are really going to like this wine because you can't get it anywhere else. And I think that is the fun too. We, we sometimes release wines that are 10, 12, 15 years old and people are going, it is impossible for me to even get these wines because we bought them and kept them for so long and then people are going, that is truly spectacular. Like you said, it comes back to that wine program, doesn't it, 15 years ago and in knowing at the time of exactly what kind of wine you'd want to be serving in 15 years, you're thinking a long way ahead. Yeah, it's, and, and it's being able to taste those wines when they're really, really young and then commit to them and uh, put them to storage. So in our cellars in France, uh, where we have main storage facilities in, in Burgundy as well as in Bordeaux, uh, we're currently keeping well over seven and a half million bottles of wine and some of them will you know you'll see on board in the next year or so but some of them will take 10 12 years before we actually see them so it's also having that level of patience uh, and uh, it, it's, it's great value for our passengers we've also seen the champagne stay on a very high level on board emirates uh, in those 15 years as well obviously you've got dom perignon available for first class and and Moet and Verve Clicquot, you've got some great brands on board. Yeah, the, the relationship that we've developed with, uh, with Dom Perignon, I mean, Dom Perignon and Emirates First Class are synonymous, right? They, 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 people have come to expect that. And over time, we've, we've become their number one client. We are their most important trading partner between Emirates and, and Dom Perignon. And uh, we're, we're doing some fun stuff with them, not just the vintage selection that they bring on board, but uh, every year we get uh, a batch of you know, Dom Perignon P2 or the very, very rare Dom Perignon Rosé 
uh, both of whom will feature this year on First Class. And uh, this year we'll actually change our vintage from 2009 back to 2008, the first time that a Champagne house has ever done that. 2008 will be an amazing vintage uh, for Champagne and uh, as far as Dom Perignon goes we have a, an airline exclusive. So for the next 12 months Emirates will be the only airline uh, being able to serve the, uh, the 2008 Dom. And when it comes to food, obviously the most important thing there is having great food alongside great wine and you, you've got a very great, again, thinking more bespoke about when you are or looking at your uh, procuring some of your food on board too, aren't you? Yeah, we, we, we don't want to be a cookie cutter uh, company. So from the Middle East here, from our hub in, uh, in, in, in Dubai, where we serve 65% of our 110 million meals we served last year alone. Uh, of course, we celebrate Arabic generosity and the cuisine of the Middle East and the cuisine, of course, of the Gulf in, in, in particular. Uh, combined with an, with an international flavor, but then from our what we call outstations, whether that is Phuket or Amsterdam or, uh, or Orlando, uh, we challenge our chefs there to come up with regional and seasonal dishes. So as an example, in a, in a couple of weeks, uh, flying uh, to and from uh, the Netherlands, uh, Germany, France and Belgium, we will see uh, white asparagus, which, uh, which, which are in season and that'll be great, followed in June more to our uh, British, uh, we do a lot of it with, uh, with, with strawberries, with, with Wimbledon coming up and, uh, and then we do all the big festive uh, periods. I mean, we've got Ramadan coming here in the Middle East, so we pay attention to that. Uh, we do most of the uh, Easter coming, of course, with, with, with uh, hot cross buns flying and, and so on. It keeps us, keeps us busy. Very famous for your Christmas menus on Emirates, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, Christmas, uh, we, we we're already planning, you know, it's only April now, we were already planning uh, for Christmas uh, later on this year and uh, we, uh, we get huge response and, and it, that is in every class James. We don't just feature and focus uh, business and, and first but 70% of my business is, is economy class driven so uh, food and wine and, 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 uh, and seasonal and regional food uh, feature heavily in all, in all of our classes. Obviously, you're taking that uh, luxury restaurant experience from the ground to the sky, and it's obviously very important to maintain that quality, isn't it? I think as you go as you go forward as well. Yeah, it, it, it um, <clears throat> uh, the, the the food and the dining experience, I still believe, is a very important part of your journey. Uh, and and uh, at Emirates, we will never ever uh, skimp on that. It is uh, uh, we're an aspirational airline. Uh, passengers have very high expectations when they when they travel with us and food is important. But you have to realize, of course, you're in a limited space. I mean, also we're in a big aluminum cigar. Uh, so space comes at a premium. Uh, there's only so much you can do. I mean, you know, we've got ovens uh, and um, uh, th there's a lot of uh, elements in, in, in your journey that we cannot control. You're bringing back the glamour of flying firmly because you look back at it, all those old photos from the 60s and 70s of the, the full, like the carving of the meat at the, at the, uh, in the aisle and that kind of thing. You're also doing it through your cocktail list. The onboard cocktail list is spectacular. Yeah, well, we're not at the point yet that, uh, that we start carving meats on board. But, you know, when you're in travel in, in first class, you know, we have uh, dedicated uh, operators that, that, that will plate your meal. And uh, we, 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 of course, have, we're famous in first class for our caviar and all the, the condiments that go with it. Uh, and you're right, you know, the, the, uh, we follow the, the, the changing trends in what people drink around the world. And at the moment it is all about cocktails, right? And all the old flavors like Manhattans and Negronis and old fashions. Uh, so when you're lucky enough to travel business class on an A380, that bar is very, very well visited. And our uh, lounge operators there are, are trained in, in recreating those cocktails. So uh, we've got some spectacular brands that we use there as, uh, as well, very premium brands. And, I'll give you um, a, a bit of a preview of that uh, a bit later, but uh, yeah, welcome aboard, I'd say. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. Anytime. Thanks, James. Let's now check out some must-have travel accessories for frequent flyers. When we hit the road, we've always got a pair of the Bose QC35 Mark II headphones with us for music, editing videos, and making calls. Not only are the QC35 IIs comfortable to wear, they offer brilliant sound thanks to the impeccable noise cancellation and audio performance, and they also go the distance with a 20-hour battery life. 
The headphones are easy to use when it comes to making calls, accessing Siri and connecting to Google Assistant. There's an action button on the left ear cup which connects straight to Google Assistant without having to grab your phone, unlock it and find the app. Bose and Google work together on the exclusive experience in the QC35 IIs, making it the first integration of Google Assistant in a headphone. Like its predecessor, the QC35 Mark II's noise cancellation is fully activated when the headphone is on, but the Bose Connect app now lets you choose to keep it on high, turn it down low, or disable it completely. The Connect app also lets you change the action button's functionality, so you can control the noise settings from the ear cup when you want and switch back to your Google Assistant when you want as well. The QC35 Mark II noise cancelling headphones come in black and silver. When it's time for sleep or trying to beat the dreaded jet lag, Bose has a brilliant solution in the form of the noise masking sleep buds. These are tiny wireless earbuds that combine a comfortable design with soothing sounds to block, cover and replace the most common noises that interfere with our sleep. Bose Sleep Buds are the smallest Bose products ever made, and they come with 10 preloaded sleep tracks that mirror the frequencies of snoring, neighbors, dogs, traffic, and much more, hiding them beneath a layer of relaxing audio. Bose Sleep Buds use low energy Bluetooth. They're iOS and Android compatible, and come with the Bose Sleep app that makes it easy to update, control, and select preferences. Bose Sleep Buds come in a brushed aluminium charging case that provides up to 16 hours of battery life unplugged, which is ideal for both travel and overnight stays. For more information, visit bose.com.au. Well, that's it from us on Wayfarer. Thanks for watching and see you next time.